In this video, we're going to be talking about maximum and minimum problems. So first, we're going to talk about local maximum, and then eventually, um, toward the end, we'll talk about absolute maximum. So a function has a local max, maximum value, at a point if, for the function value at that point, it's greater than or equal to all other function values at that point. And it's a local min if exactly the opposite is true. For the function value evaluated at that point, it's less than or equal to all other function values evaluated at that point. Now, there's a quick note here that I have where I said this is for all x and y in the domain of f near that point. And the reason to mention this is because this is going to affect the difference between a local max or min and an absolute max or min when we take a look at that. Now, in order to find our local max or min of our function, we need to find what are called the critical points of our function. So this can occur um, in one of two ways. The first way is if your partial derivative with respect to x at that point equals zero, and, um, and the same thing for the partial derivative with respect to y. So if either of these, or if both of these are zero, um, this could be a critical point. Similarly, we can have a critical point if either of these partial derivatives does not exist. So if f of x, or s sub x, or f sub y, the partial derivatives here, um, if either one of them do not exist at that point, then that is also considered a critical point. Now one other thing to mention here, this point a comma b, it has to be an interior point of the domain of our function. Now for example, let's find the critical points of this function described here. So we need to figure out both partial derivatives, first with respect to x and then with respect to y. So our partial derivative with respect to x of this function would be 4x minus 8, and we want to set this equal to 0 to find our critical point. So if we solve this, we're going to end up getting that x is equal to 2. Now our partial derivative with respect to y of our function is going to be 2y minus 8, set this equal to 0, and we get a y value of 4. Now notice we only have one x value and one y value, so this can only lead to one point. So then our critical point I'll just say CP, our critical point is at 2 comma 4. If you have a function where when you find the partial derivatives you solve for 0, you get more than one x or y value, then what you do is you take, for example, you could just start with the f um, sub x function, the partial derivative with respect to x, you can take those two or however many x values, plug them in to the partial derivative with respect to y and see which x values correspond to which y values. So again, if you get more than one x value here, what you would do is you would just take each one, plug it in here to the derivative with respect to y and, and see which x values correspond to which y values. Now that we know how to find the critical points for our function, we use a second derivative test to figure out if those points our local maximums, minimums, a saddle point, or none of it, none of those. So in order to use the second derivative test, we need what's called the discriminant of our function f, and this is equal to this expression here. So we have the discriminant being the product of the second order partial derivatives with respect to x and then y, minus the square of the mixed second partial derivative. And if you take a look, this is actually just the discriminant of a two, or I'm sorry, the determinant of the two by two matrix right here, um, where this matrix is called the Hessian matrix. So if you have a continuous function, the mixed second order partial derivatives are actually equal to each other. So that's why this is squared. So four possibilities occur when you have this discriminant. The first two are actually the same in terms of your discriminant value. They're both positive. So if you have this calculation at your point AB and it's positive, then you also have to evaluate the second order partial derivative um, with respect to x at your point AB. And then depending on whether or not that's positive or negative, you have your max or min. So if this is um, your second partial derivative with respect to x is negative, that implies that you have a local maximum at that point. One of these should be positive. I forgot to switch the sign here. Let's see. Now, if this is positive, if your second order partial derivative with respect to x is positive at your point AB, then that's a local minimum. Now, if your discriminant value turns out to be negative, then what that means is your point AB is actually a saddle point. So a saddle point is 
if you can just picture a saddle, and I'll do my best to draw this quick sketch of a saddle like graph. So if we have this saddle and we have a point right here, well, if we are close to this point, our function actually assumes values um, greater than and less than this point. So function values like maybe right here are less than our point and function values right here are greater than our point. So that's what's called a saddle point. And if the last possibility, your discriminant value actually equals zero, then what that means is this test is an inconclusive way to determine if that point is a local maximum or saddle point. Now considering the first example that we looked at, we already figured out that we have a critical point at 2 comma 4, and we've just determined what the partial derivatives with respect to x and y are. Now we want to figure out using the second derivative test whether this critical point is a local max, min, a saddle point, or if it's none of them. And so we need to use the discriminant. Let me rewrite that for us here. So we need d of our point here, x, uh, y is 2 comma 4. We need the second partial derivative with respect to x at this point times the second partial derivative with respect to y at this point minus the square of the mixed partial second partial derivative at this point squared. <clears throat> All right, so our second partial second partial derivative with respect to x is going to be four. With respect to y, this is going to be two, and our so our second order partial derivative with respect to x and then y is going to be this the derivative of this with respect to y, which is just going to be zero. Okay, so when we plug this into our expression here, we end up getting 4 times 2 minus 0 squared, which equals 8. Now, if you, at this stage of the work, if you had um, expressions where you still needed to plug in x and y, then you would just do so with your point 2 comma 4, these values here. We didn't have to do that. We, When we took the partial derivatives for the second time, we didn't get any... Uh, functions of x and y, we just got constants. But if we did, we would plug in these values, 2 and 4. So now we have to determine out of our four cases where we're going to go next, and because this discriminant value is positive, this leads to case 1 and 2. And if you recall from the cases, we need to look at the partial derivative with respect to x, the second partial derivative with respect to x, and determine what happens here. Now we got just a constant, so we don't actually have to plug in our point. 2 comma 4, um, but if we did, we would do we would plug in those values, and so because our second partial derivative with respect to x is positive, our discriminant value is positive, then that leads to case number 2, and that tells us that our point, our critical point, 2 comma 4, is a local min, based on our second derivative test. So the last thing we want to look at is an absolute max and minimum value. So our function has an absolute maximum if when you evaluate your function at that point, it's greater than or equal to all other function values, opposite with the absolute min if your function value at that point is less than or equal to all other function values. Now this is exactly the same as local max and min. The difference here is in this sentence I have at the bottom, this is for all x and y in a set R on which our function is defined. Now, the, if you recall, for local max and min, we had for all x and y near our point a, b. Now, we're extending that to the entire region on which our function is defined. So, that the change is going to be that we're going to have to consider boundary values of our region as well. So, we're going to consider our same example that we've been looking at. And now, we're going to say that this um, function is defined on a region r where R is this triangular region defined with these vertices 0, 0, 2, 4, and 0, 4. So what we have to do is we actually have to find the endpoints and the critical points for each of our boundary edges. And then we're going to determine whether um, each of those points are absolute max or min values. So I'm going to go ahead and label these three edges. This one we'll call R1, this one R2, and the last one R3. So for R1, we need to define this in terms of our function. So for R1, if you notice, 
you have this vertical line. So our y is varying, but our x is staying constant at zero. So this is gonna be our function for x being zero, but y varying. So if I just plug in a zero for every x into our function and leave y as it is, I get y squared minus eight y plus two. Okay, and now, so we have to have our endpoints and our critical points for this function, this boundary function. So our endpoints, we can tell by the picture of the graph of the region, 0, 0, and 0, 4. And so for the critical points, we're going to find those like we did before. We're going to set the derivative equal to 0. So the critical points are going to come from the derivative of this, so r1 prime setting equal to 0. So we end up getting that 2y minus 8 equals 0, giving us that y equals 4. So then we need to plug in these values into our, these points into our function. So we need f of 0, 0, f of 0, 4, those are our two endpoints. And then we need f of our y value being 4, plugging back into this r1 boundary function, so 0, 4 which we have right here above. So we don't have to do it twice, but just to note, we got it twice through this process. So zero, zero, plugging in into our function, we get zero minus zero plus zero minus zero equals two. So all of that gives us a two. If we plug in zero, four, every x is going to get a zero, so I'm just gonna focus on the y's. We get four squared minus eight times four plus two giving us a grand total of negative 14. All right, so let's go ahead and just keep track of what we're getting here because we have to determine at the end which points are our absolute max or min points. So zero, zero is gonna give us a function value of two. Zero, four gives us a function value of negative 14. All right, so we're gonna do the same thing for the next boundary, R2. Now for R2, this is going to be this top horizontal line. So our function, the x's are varying, but our y value is staying constant at four. So if we evaluate our function where x is varying, but y is four, we just plug in four for every y, and then we'll simplify. Okay, so if we end up simplifying this, we'll get two x squared minus eight x minus 14. Okay, So for this top R2 boundary, we have our endpoints of 0, 4, and 2, comma 4, just by looking at the region. And then our critical point is going to come from, just like the last boundary edge, setting this um, function, our edge function, uh, the derivative equal to 0. So the derivative of R2 is going to be 4x minus 8 equals 0 gives us x equals 2. So we need to plug in our boundary edges, our boundary points, excuse me, f of, th this time it's actually 0, 4. We need the other boundary, 2, 4, and then we need 2, x being 2, plugged into our R2 function, so 2, comma, Four, which we have here. We won't evaluate it twice, um, but just to note again, we, we did get this twice through this process. So we've actually already done the work for zero, four. We figured out just a moment ago it was negative 14. Now we already figured out in the previous example that the point two negative, or sorry, two comma four was a local minimum, so, but we did have not plugged this in yet into our function to figure out what the function value actually is. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just plugging in two comma four into our function to evaluate it. Okay, and we're gonna simplify. And after we simplify this um, quantity, we end up getting negative 22. And we, that's the same for this. So then just add it to our list over here. When we plugged in two comma four into our function, we got negative 22, okay? And so we already know that that's a local minimum, and so far it's the absolute min at this point because it's the smallest value of our function out of our critical in, uh, points and our endpoints. So the last thing we have to look at is that last boundary edge. 
Our last boundary edge, R3, well this one's slightly different because X and Y, neither one are constant. This is a sloped line, so if you recall from just equations of lines, we have to have our slope um, and then our y-intercept. So our y-intercept is at 0, 0, and our slope, we're going to rise 4 and run 2. So this is actually going to be the line y equals 2x, because the slope is 4 divided by 2. Okay, so we're going to use this in our function. So our function is going to be x comma y, but we're defining y as 2x. All right. So in our function, we're plugging in just a 2x everywhere we see a y. So this is going to be 2x squared minus 8 times 2x plus 2. And then if we simplify this, we end up getting 6x squared minus 24x plus 2. So just like we've been doing, we've been looking at the endpoints of our boundary edge. So for this boundary edge, the endpoints are 0, 0, and 2, comma 4. And then we needed the critical points for this boundary edge. So again, just like the previous two edges, we need to set the derivative of this edge function equal to 0. So that's going to be 12x minus 24 equals 0, giving us x equals 2. So then we would need our function evaluated at 0, 0, at 2, 4, and then also at 2, comma, plugging this into our um, R3 boundary edge, 2, comma, 2 times 2. So again, 2, comma, 4. And we've actually already done all three of, all two of these, and there we labeled them here. So these were all of the possibilities, all of everything we went through and all the points we got, these were all the possibilities for absolute max or minimum values, and so there's only these three. So then what you do is you just say, well, which one's the smallest function value, which one's the biggest, and that corresponds to the minimum and the maximum. So we have, because, let's go ahead and erase this, because we have at f evaluated at 2, comma 4, negative 22, that's the smallest of our values, then our function value, this is the absolute minimum. So we have an absolute min at 2 comma 4. We already knew it was a local min, now we know it's a maximum or absolute min on our region R for which our function is defined. And then f of 0, 0 was the biggest value we got out. It was equal to 2, so 2 is our absolute max. So we have an absolute max at 0, 0.